Thank you, Joe. I hadn't heard that song before. I really like that. That's a, it gets you kind of rallied and ready to, to, to go and do some work. And uh, I appreciate us uh, uh, getting to sing that. Vigorously in March time. And that's what we're talking about today. We're going to be talking about salt and light and what we are, our responsibilities are in this world. But before we get into that, I was gone last week. I, I was in, at the end of January, I went to Malibu, California at Pepperdine University, all at the expense of drug dealers. Now, you might be thinking, what in the world are you talking about? It's not the kind of drug dealers you might be thinking of. We're talking about a pharmaceutical company, and this pharmaceutical company, what, though some of us have issues with pharmaceutical companies, this particular one gave $1.25 million to help preachers get better at preaching. Specifically, Church of Christ Preachers. Pepperdine University uh, applied for a grant with the Lilly Foundation, and they gave $1.25 million to help preachers get better at preaching. So this is a company that cares both for your soul and your body. So I think I kind of like that, that, that foundation. Sounds pretty, pretty interesting to me. And they paid for a really nice experience in Malibu, California. And when we got there, I get and I look out over the Pacific Ocean. You can see up in this picture right here, that's Malibu. You look out over the Pacific Ocean in my hotel room. I had a corner room and one of the windows looked out over the Pacific. The other window looked out over the mountains of Malibu. It was absolutely beautiful. They gave us dinners, they gave us lunches, they gave us breakfast at Pepperdine University, and, and we ate uh, beef tenderloin for lunch and, and all sorts of wonderful breakfasts. And at night, they took us out to these different restaurants. They took us to one restaurant that Lady Gaga often rides her horse down to. Not that any of us are Lady Gaga, and maybe some of you are, I don't know. And we ride our horse, she rides her horse down to this, this wonderful restaurant. And they sat us all at this table. There were 24 ministers that, that they asked to be part of this program. And they fed us all sorts of appetizers. And I remember eating these different flatbreads. And I think flatbreads are just pizza, right? But maybe California, they call them flatbreads to be fancy. And they gave us this wonderful appetizers. And then I see at the end of the table, or in the middle of the table, there was this uh, beef tartare. And the guys didn't want that, and I said, hey, why don't you pass that down to me? I've never had beef tartare. I've had tuna tartare, and I assume I like some rare meat. And they pass it down to me, and I grab it. It's on this thing that looks like a little bit of a corn chip, and I take a big bite of it. And it is not beef tartare. I might have given it away if you look at the picture. That is beet tartare. Beet tartare. If you're asking, beet tartare is not good. I hope I didn't offend any beet fans in here. So I ate it. I didn't ask for any more. I said they can take it back to the middle of the table. But they did right by me. They brought me a, some fresh caught fish with a wonderful sauce, and then they gave us macadamia nut brownies. The next night, they took us out to a place where they actually gave us beef and chicken and, and uh, crab cakes. They had other flatbreads there, but this one was butternut squash flatbread. I already was duped by the beet tartare. I tried it, and it was actually really good. And then they had beet hummus. And I had my share of beets. I wasn't going to try the beet hummus. They treated us very nicely in this uh, workshop. But they also had responsibilities for us. And they called us to do some things that brought us out of our comfort zone. Out of the 24 preachers that were there, they asked us to come up and do these sermonettes or just different things so they could critique us in front of everybody. And these guys, they are 
trained preachers. There were some, some uh, novice preachers, and there were some, some very, uh, very, very uh, uh, experienced master preachers. And not one of us was excited to get in front of the room and be critiqued in front of our peers and our coaches. But they treated us so well. They showed us that we were valued so well that we were willing to do what they were asking of us. And for the next year, we are now called to meet at least once a month with these coaches and with a team of other preachers and get better at our job, get better at preaching. And one of the reasons that we were called to get better at preaching, it doesn't mean I'm going to be the greatest preacher in the world. Hopefully I will get better. But one of the things our coaches told us is why you do this is because your congregation is worth it. The congregation deserves to have you do your best. Now, the congregation doesn't deserve to take advantage of you, but the congregation does deserve for you to be best at proclaiming the word of God. That's what we're called to do, to do our best. And when we feel valued, it makes it a whole lot easier for us to do our best. It makes it a whole lot easier to do what we were called to do, proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. To go out there and rally the troops and be ready. Matthew chapter 13, or chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a lamp and, or light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In my last two lessons, I talked about blessings that we've received. The blessings that God gives us as we live in this life. And some of these blessings are wonderful to hear. It tells us that we're blessed when we're poor, whether it's physically poor or spiritually poor. It tells us that we are blessed when we seek righteousness, seek to please God. And then it gives us some blessings that are hard it tells us we can even be blessed when we're mourning when we're dealing with loss and suffering it tells us we can be blessed when we are ridiculed for our beliefs we've given we're given all sorts of blessings and i love how jesus starts out this wonderful sermon with blessings we don't just follow commands we have a blessing that we're going to receive when we follow him but with blessings also comes opportunity uh, comes responsibility we have responsibility in this world to do certain things to reach out to others to follow his commands to be what he wants us to be i love the creation story how God takes nothing and creates everything. He creates everything out of nothing. And, and we have this wonderful world that we live in. We have oceans. And we have the piney woods of East Texas. We have fish in the sea and birds in the air we have the animals that roam along the ground and we have people that we have a relationship with and he gives us so much variety in this world 
If you're a sci-fi fan, if you watch Star Wars or Star Trek or anything like that, you'll notice that on the planets of these sci-fi films, I've said this before, it, it's, it's interesting because they're all the same thing. So like in Star Wars, they go to Cloud City and it's all just a giant city of big buildings. And then there's desert on Tatooine where Luke Skywalker's from and it's all desert. The whole, the whole planet's desert. But God doesn't do that for us. God gives us variety. The beautiful oceans of Malibu, the piney woods of East Texas. and This is pretty neat. God gives us this variety, but he gives us responsibility with this world. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it's going to show us our responsibility. It's going to give us guidelines. It's going to give us consequences when we don't follow these guidelines and... It's going to say we're not alone doing this. It reads in chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it. Take care of it. And the Lord God commanded man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. When you eat from it, you'll certainly die. The Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So look at what God did. He created this beautiful world and then he gave us responsibility. He, he has us in here to work it. God rests on the seventh day. And then he lets us take on a job. He lets us work in this beautiful world. I, once you would take uh, kids on wilderness trek, uh, some of our students went on wilderness trek this uh, past year. And one of the things that the guides on wilderness trek, it's, it's taking a youth group up into the mountains and they get to uh, climb a mountain and they get to camp and they get to cook their food and, and do all the things that you do in the wilderness for a full week. And one of the things that the guides tell the adults that are in the group, they say, Sit back, unless it is a safety issue, let the kids lead. That's pretty interesting. Let the kids lead. Why? Because it helps them grow. It helps them do better. And so they say, even if the kids are going to ruin your dinner, and they do, let them lead. It's hard for adults not to let kids lead, or to let kids lead, right? We see they're doing wrong and we want to jump in, but we weren't supposed to here. And look at what God does for us. He says, I created this wonderful world, now work it. God rests and he's here for our safety. He's here to reach out, but he gives it to us. He gives us responsibility. And he gives us guidelines. Don't eat from this tree. And now we have... A whole list of guidelines because they ate from the tree, the one thing, right? Well, this book isn't just a book of commands. It's a love letter from God to us, showing us how we can get close to God, how we can see who he is, how we can go and be salt and light into the world. And in this book, we find consequences when we don't follow him. But he also says we're not doing it alone. He says, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll create a, help, help, a, suit, a helper suitable for him. And so God created Eve. And that's one of the things we see in a marriage is we're not just in this alone, but we have a helper. But even if you're not married, God's given us this spiritual family and we have helpers, right? That's what the church is for. To help one another. And with this responsibility, with these guidelines, with the idea of being helpers to one another, what are we called to be? Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, you are salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. 
So he calls us salt. And most of us know what salt is, right? We all know what salt is. It's the seasoning that we put on our food. But salt has other purposes. And one thing you might not realize, probably one of the more important things in your life that, salt come, uh, that, that, that involves salt is the word salary. Do you realize that salary comes from the word salt? It was back in Jesus' time, the Roman soldiers were paid their solarium, Argentum. You ever heard that word? No? Well, you know what it means? Salt and silver. So when the Roman soldiers were paid, they were paid in salt and silver. And so one of the expressions that we get in today's world was, is, he's not worth his salt. She's not worth her salt. What does that mean? They're not doing the job that God created or that, that they were supposed to do, right? They're not doing their job. If you're not worth your salt, it means you're not doing what you were supposed to do. And so when Jesus tells us, you are salt of the earth, as he's saying, you have a responsibility to do your job? Maybe. But I think one of the things that Jesus is saying is specifically what salt does for us. Why did the Roman soldiers get paid in salt and silver? Well, one of the things they got paid in salt and silver was because with their salt comes their rations. And if they don't want their food to spoil, they needed to have salt over that. So I guess they ate beef jerky. So salt preserves. And maybe Jesus is telling them, we're the salt of the earth. We're helping people to not experience moral decay. Maybe that's what Jesus means, and I do think that we have a responsibility to go out and tell others about him. We have a responsibility to keep moral decay, to keep sinful life out of this world. But I think most importantly, Jesus is saying, you're salt of the earth, meaning you're here to add flavor to this world. What does that mean to be, add flavor to this world? It means to add, make it something good, something pleasing. And so as Christians, we are called to do good. We're called to add flavor. And if we add flavor, we can't be bland people. This past March, I went to England for the first time. If you've ever been to England, it's a pretty neat place, but don't go there for the food. Why? Why? They don't use salt. They don't use spices. Mary was listening to a YouTube the other day, and, and, they, and, and the guy said, these are the people that conquered India, the land of spices, and yet never knew how to use it. We're not called to be bland people. We are called to flavor this world with something wonderful, something people want. But sometimes... We're beet tartare, right? We give people what they don't want. We provide a flavor that no one wants. And it's not that God is telling us to provide this flavor. It's we get wrapped up in things that are not giving glory to him. So we're called to be salt. We're not called to be beet tartare. Then he tells them, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can be, cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. The second thing Jesus is telling the people is they are called to be light in this world. And as I stated in the welcome we live in a tough world. We have sorrow. We have pain. Some of us are in mourning because of loss and heartache. And God says, I have a responsibility for you to go out and be light to the world. 
Shed your light in this dark world. And how do we do that? We do that by being salty. We're in a tough season right now. We're about to start another political season, right? And sometimes, instead of being salt and light, we get wrapped up in our political affiliation, right? And that becomes more important than being salt and light in this world. And, and, and this, this gets all wrapped up and it's hard to not be beat tartar to the world. But God says, be salt. Know what message that you're going to be giving to people. Whether it's verbally, whether it's online. Remember, we have a responsibility to make this world better, not to add to the darkness. So we're called to be light. John 1 verse 4 says, In Jesus is life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. What's so beautiful about light is it doesn't matter how black, how dark this world can be, you shine one little light and it cuts through all of the darkness, right? There's nothing that can make light go out. The darkest dark cannot overcome the light. And while we have a world that might be against your message, if we're truly being salt of the earth, our light is going to shine and people are going to see our God. That's why he says in verse 16. He says in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light shine. How do we do that? It's by showing compassion to others. It's by giving your time to others. When you see a need, you actually do something about it. We speak words of encouragement to others. We show love. We show peace. We show kindness. And all these things sound really good. And I love how Jesus starts the sermon because we're about to get into the commands that Jesus is going to give us. And as we give these commands, we remember as Christians, we're called to be light in this world. We're called not to put a bowl over it. This world's pretty interesting. It's... Uh, in Jesus' day, people were used as sport. They would take them into the Roman Colosseums and they would have animals tear them apart. The world's gotten better. We don't do that, at least not here. We're not perfect. But even 150 years ago, I was looking at my ancestry I, I was looking at, at all the u.s senses of of ancestry and one of the questions they ask on here is is this person an idiot Isn't that weird that's a question on all the senses in the 1840s why would they ask that question it, it said are they an idiot are they dumb are they a lunatic are they deaf because these people weren't valued as much they were less than a person we don't ask that question on the census anymore why because we're more tolerant and that's a good thing but on there there's other ways that we're so tolerant that we forget the message of jesus christ and we put a bowl over this tolerance doesn't mean that you don't Tell people the good news of Jesus. Tolerance shows kindness. 
But it doesn't put a bowl over us. And one of the things that we're called to do is goodness in the name of the Lord. So they don't just praise us for the good things we do, but they praise God. They see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. We're called to be salt and light. We're called to do good for this world. We're called to add flavoring to this world. We're called to let our light shine out. We're not called to be people that just blend into the world, but to provide something good. If you want to provide something good to this world, if you want to show uh, that we're called to live pure and show goodness, you can do that. But the first step is to give your life to Jesus Christ. We do that by being baptized into him, raised with him. But we don't stay in those waters. We go out into this world and we add flavoring. If we can help you with anything today, please come while we stand and sing.